Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Fritz Mayer, Dean of the Corbell School of International Studies, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to another edition of Faculty Friday. Today, it's my great pleasure to be talking with Professor Deborah Avant, who is Director and Chair of the C. Cal, uh, Chow Kang Center for International Security and Diplomacy. Um, a wonderful scholar, uh, whose work uh, touches on many, many issues that we'll talk about today, uh, but particularly civil military relations and the role, roles of non-state actors in controlling violence and generating governance. Um, she's published uh, very widely. Most recent the book, I think, is, um, is in Civil Action and the Dynamics of Violence, which she uh, co-authored co and co-edited with a number of our colleagues here at the Corbell School. And we'll be talking about that a bit in, in a moment. Um, uh, Professor Avan is a model of the engaged scholar. She regularly advises governments, companies, NGOs, uh, serves on numerous uh, governing and editorial boards. Um, she's uh, uh, highly esteemed in the field and indeed is the incoming president of the International Studies Association, the premier professional association of our business. Uh, and beyond all that, a wonderful teacher, colleague, mentor, and indeed friend. So welcome to Faculty Friday, Debbie. Thanks, Fred. So I'm so happy to be here. Uh, this, is, this is going to be fun. Well, uh, I mentioned in, your, in the intro that you're the director of the, oh, the short version is the C Center. Indeed, you were the founding director of the C Center, which is now enjoying its 10th anniversary. I'm sure that time has gone really fast. It, it, you know, we had the occasion recently to review the history of the C Center over 10 years, and it's really quite remarkable what you've been able to accomplish and the center's been able to accomplish in 10 years. Um, I'm just, I'm curious from your perspective now, looking back at those 10 years, if you were to, you know, what do you see as the major accomplishments of the C Center? Well, I've actually been thinking about this a lot. Um, we're we're planning lots of hoopla around our tenth anniversary, um, and I think it really boils down to um, uh, the people um, we've had, the funding we've been able to get, um, the purpose that we've developed, and um, what I see as our increasing impact in the world. Um, and I'll just kind of elaborate on each of those. Um, the people are what the C Center is built on. Um, the first person I hired actually was a staff member, Jill Hero, which you've now stolen away from me into the Dean's office. Um, <laughs> but Jill was a tremendous partner um, in developing the C Center. But then also faculty members, Erica Chenoweth, Colin Hendricks, Holly Kaplan. We pulled in people like Rachel Epstein who are already on the faculty. Um, we actually won a competition at the university to hire someone in gender, um, thinking that if we had the mm. gender dimension, we would be able to be even more successful. And we're able to hire Marie Berry, who has exceeded all of our expectations. Mm. Um, and then we've been, um, we, we were really built the gift agreement for the C Center, um, talks about a group of C fellows. And we have had C fellows every year that have been integrally related with the center and have just gone on to do tremendous things um, in the world. So the people have just been amazing. We, because of those people have brought in a lot of money, um, more than yes. $9 million in 10 years. It's not a bad average um, for mm -hmm. a brand new center. Um, and, and that money is not just important because of the money, although I'm sure the University of Denver loves it, but, um, but it's really allowed us to do um, a lot of important things. And, and that really brings me to our purpose, which I don't think was all the way clear when I arrived. Um, I'm kind of tend to a more sort of organic style of leadership. Um, and and it, so our purpose really evolved over time. And um, I think it's, it's most clearly articulated now as a focus, not just on security, but on how security interfaces with other important issues, mm. particularly mm. around prosperity and social justice. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that has been, you know, sort of a key part. And then, you know, that, that purpose has begun to be felt in the world. Um, and you mentioned the civil action book, um, and I'll just 
you know, we've had a lot of impact both individually, you know, a lot of our faculty advise policymakers all the time. And then as a group, we actually had the National Intelligence Council's Strategic Futures Group visit us to talk with us about non-state actors and different forms of governance. But um, most recently, um, I had a call or an email from Senator Gary Peters staff member um, asking about the civil action book and the way in which it might provide strategies for the US to think about engagement in Afghanistan um, after the withdrawal. Um, which totally warmed my heart um, that That's the book fabulous. was being read by staffers and that the U.S. Um, is sort of thinking about creative ways that it might engage. So, so there's a nutshell of, um, uh, of what I think our big accomplishments have been. Well, that's a great overview. I mean, it, you really touch on the ways in which the C Center is, is, is uh, really at the heart of a lot of the intellectual activity of uh, Corbell School and the ways in which security touches on and is related to so many of the other issues that we work on. The other thing you were saying just really at the end here is, is um, you know, this focus on, um, on engaged scholarship, on, on, on not just talking amongst ourselves as academics, but in engaging with practitioners, um, both in the formulation of the research, in the doing of the research, which I think was the case in the book, uh, the, 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 the Civil Action book. But then also, of course, as you just said, the, um, being able to connect with you know, senator staff or uh, NGOs or UN organizations and the, and the like to actually, well, advise them and actually have an an impact on that. I know one of the you, you one of the the, the well, I think the current project of the C Center or one of them there are several um, is is really around that question of of what are the obligations or the ethics of a scholar who is in the, who is engaged in actually not just writing a book that only other scholars read, but actually may be in a position of advising. Um, and because it does, raise, it, it does raise a different set of obligations, doesn't it, than, than um, let's call it the more traditional scholar model. Right, right. And, you know, it's interesting because there's been um, actually a tremendous amount of um, energy around this idea of bridging the gap, which Alexander George talked about way back in the day. Mm -hmm. um, a good friend of mine, Jim Goldgeier, uh, Bruce Jenelson, a number of others have been sort of engaged in this for quite some time. And the Carnegie Corporation of New York has, has funded many of these endeavors. Um, and I was, I was actually at a, um, one of these Carnegie meetings um, and, um, and talking actually about our civil action project. And um, a, a longtime um, colleague of mine, Mike Desch, who we were actually postdocs mm. together um, way back. Um, anyway, he asked me, so what's your theory of victory? Um, you know, like, how do you mm. make sure that you know that you've won the day in your advising? And that comment, um, I think, is, is really the spur to our recent project, because I don't think that we think about ourselves as engaged in a sort of battle with policymakers, we're, we're going to win. Um, <laughs> we, we, we are really thinking about, um, about um, policy engagement as something um, that we're, we're endeavoring to study things that we care about in a way of making them better. And in doing that, um, we, we have respect for the people that we're engaging with. And um, it's funny, I, I think we, we bring theory to practice as much as we bring mm -hmm. practice to theory. You know, um, we're we're trying to, you know, to understand from what's going on in the world, but but also put it in historical perspective. Think about it in a little bit more abstract way. Um, and so I think that um, what when we started thinking about what we might do around that, um, one of the most important things we realized is that people don't actually reflect on that very much. Um, and so a lot of what we're doing around responsible policy engagement is actually engendering a series of reflections and getting people to, you know, in their own experience, think about the times that they've just felt a little squeamish about something, um, either about, um, you know, sort of whether people would listen to this advice, whether it'd be kind of off the rails, 
you know, how to explain really complicated social science terms to um, policymakers who are brilliant in many ways, but may not be familiar with them. And so in sort of engaging with those sorts of things, um, we're, we're trying to encourage more attention to these ethical issues and the kind of responsibilities that scholars have to the world that they study. Yeah, I, I just think it's a great subject matter, great, uh, in a way, it's kind of a signature piece for the Corbell School. I mean, we, we really are committed to um, doing work that matters um, uh, and has an impact. And then, but being reflective about it, as someone myself who spent a little bit of time in the policy world and have partially you know, attempted to bridge that gap, there is a gap sometimes. And it does, it is, uh, um, it does, uh, at least in my experience, it, it's sobering when you think someone might actually listen to what you have to say and they might actually take action. Um, it does force a kind of reflection as you, as you say. Well, let me, I wanna shift a little bit more to your work. It's, um, um, although this is all your work and, 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 and certainly part of it. Um, much of your writing uh, is, is about uh, the role of pragmatism in international affairs. Um, and it really, uh, my read, I've really enjoyed this week uh, uh, going back and reading uh, some of your, your articles and thinking about this, it really offers a different theoretical perspective for you know, big thoughts about the, the nature of the international system and, uh, and how it works and how it evolves. Uh, pragmatism, of course, is a tradition in American political thought, uh, going back to Dewey and others. Um, but what do you mean by pragmatism in international affairs? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, it's funny because I, I actually did political theory when I was in graduate school and thought about taking one of my exams in it, but I moved away from that. And I had read Dewey, but hadn't thought about it all that much um, until about 10 or 12 years ago um, when there was actually kind of an explosion of of. Um, thinking and research around pragmatism. And I use that word a lot in my work, but I, I've, I've really kind of delved into that literature mm -hmm. more recently. And I think what I find so useful is that pragmatism is a way of thinking about global politics in terms of interdependencies, mm -hmm. interdependent people, interdependent groups, interdependent issues. And on practices that are more or less democratic. Uh, pragmatism you know, has this um, quality about it. Um, it you know, that's partly um, a product of its history. It grew out of the um, American Civil War, people trying to sort of process the American Civil War. So it has a bias against using um, violence. And um, a lot of the orientation of it is democratic and a democratic not just in terms of voting, but in terms of respect for other humans, respect for other uh, perspectives. And so I think it gives us a different orientation to the global system that for one thing allows us to understand more than just governments interacting, mm -hmm. um, which yeah. you know, my experience um, in, um, in understanding global governments, governance was really applied to begin. It was in participating in yeah. this um, private security governance um, endeavor. And it looked nothing like textbook um, yeah. arguments <laughs> about experience. states interacting. And so yeah. I think pragmatism opens a way for thinking about how people interact around problems, about whether they are more or less inclusive, about um, whether they pay attention to what works or not. Um, and I think it's a really productive way of, of trying to study and manage um, the, the complicated and interdependent world that we live in. So it, it, it takes a, a, um, uh, certainly a different uh, you, you know, um, framing than most of the, let's call it traditional IR theories. Um, you mentioned, uh, you know, you, someone once said you can't take the state to dinner, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the, the dominance of the government, the state, almost as if it were a, you know, unitary actor. Of course, there's a great, you know, quite an extensive literature on that. But the, the let's call it the, the mainstream uh, thinking about our IRs is, is uh, it doesn't have this kind of 
uh, practical problem solving, multi actor, uh, 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 relational, fluid kind of dynamic uh, to it. I was struck by one of your uh, uh, an essay you wrote entitled "Mainstream Allergy to Pragmatism's Femininities," so which is when and you argue in it that uh, you know tr traditional IR that that has dominated the field often sort of dismisses pragmatism with with um, uh, you know, el you know it's, uh, characterizations that are often associated with femininity. Um, and I, uh, which is which is is striking. But say a bit more about what is missed because of that dismissal by the let's call it the more masculine dominated traditional IR. Right, right. So this is one of my favorite papers, um, partly because it builds on some of the work that I did in graduate school um, on femininities. Um, cool. And I, I was warned against going to the feminist ghetto, um, which is something that I hope that um, advisors no longer tell their graduate students. Oh um, but, um, but anyways, it was been fun to sort of get back to that. But I think we actually miss a ton. Um, and I, I could like, you know, go on for hours about this, but I won't. Um, I'll just mention two. Yeah. Um, first is we, in social science, there is this incredible quest for certainty and clarity, yeah. despite the fact that we're studying humans who are notoriously uncertain and unclear. Yeah. Um, and I think this bias leads us to disciplinarity it leads us to, you know, being really clear about how we operationalize something. So it's not how we talk about it. It's not how we use it. It's how we operationalize it so we can count it. And I'm not dismissing that. I mean, I think those things are all important, but we have to realize the degree to which they are creating caricatures and sort of ignoring elements that can be actually incredibly important to how we interact together. And, um, you know, we often miss the importance of narratives as you have written about. Um, we miss, we think about the expert as like, you know, you now have expertise. So all the authorities invested in you rather than thinking about expertise as critical thinking and the development of expertise among many uh, participants. And um, it's, you know, that, that, Certainty, clarity, I think um, misses important sort of fuzzy dimensions of the human condition that are incredibly important. The second thing that I think is really important actually came up in our politics hour this morning um, with mm -hmm. a bunch of faculty and students um, uh, across the university, um, which is a bias toward kind of extreme and forceful solutions. Mm -hmm. And actually, we were talking about Frances Haugen, the Facebook whistleblower. Yeah. And she's getting a bad rap in the media um, and actually in our events um, for the question about, well, should we break up Facebook? And she said, no, I don't think that's the best way to approach it. And many people are saying she had the chance to like solve our problem, to squash Facebook. Mm. And what people are missing is she went, she didn't stop her sentence then. She went on to outline a variety of ways in which we might change the way Facebook and other social media companies operate. And that change might induce more competition. It might induce more thoughtfulness, less spreading of disinformation, um, you know, uh, ways in which we might mediate the way social media affects teenagers and their um, body images. And these, these kind of softer, more nuanced ways are often the way in which we actually make effective policy. And, um, and I feel like they're often dismissed. Oh, no. that's a soft way. That's not serious. No. No. Um, and, um, and so I, I would love it if those things were taken more seriously, because I think especially in, in, in a world where, you know, we've just had 20 years of a global war on terror that we don't have a lot to show for that we're proud of, um, looking at these less forceful solutions, no. less extreme solutions, 
may provide us with more fodder for um, yeah. for effective problems. No, that's, that's so interesting. Indeed, uh, uh, I know from conversations with you, uh, you often hesitate to even use the word solutions. Uh, that is, as if a problem can be solved you know, once and for all. There's a, a saying, you know, for every complex problem, there's a simple solution, and it's wrong. I mean, and, and the tendency towards that, uh, it, it's fascinating, you and I were talking earlier, um, it, you know, it's, it, I was saying in, in some ways, this is kind of a optimistic way of thinking of the world that is that, that it's not so determined that it really does depend on relationships on interactions on dynamics that there's a kind of space to solve problems. On the other hand, it, it does it does uh, stop short of, of kind of imagining at least that we can solve these problems. Is that, is that a fair char characterization? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think pragmatism, it's, um, it, it's interesting in, um, in a couple of things I'm working on. Um, I talk about the way it interfaces with almost every um, kind of social theory. And in fact, a lot of people use the sort of pragmatic um, frame as a way of taking advantage of insights of various different theories and kind of using them together. But I think um, it is not idealistic. And it's interesting because a lot of critical mm. theory um, that I've engaged with quite a lot and, and really appreciate has this implicit idealism in it um, about this kind of emancipatory, emancipatory potential, um, which I completely endorse. But but we are human beings and the possibility that we will all be able to live together in a way that all of us feel affirmed all of the time is, is not great. I mean, think about your Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> and these are with people you love and know. Um, you know, so, um, so I think that pragmatism does, um, it does put the bar for what are, you know, useful solutions or useful management strategies lower. Um, than many of the more kind of idealistic perspectives. But it does differ from, you know, realism and other um, theories in, um, in, in imagining always the possibility for human growth um, and the way in which we might manage solutions, come to new ideas. Creativity is a really key element of pragmatism. Um, that um, that does make our world and our experience better. Yeah, let me let me ask you. I'm going to ask you to kind of apply. Imagine you're, you're, you, uh, Joe Biden gave you a call and wanted to know, uh, you know, what you would advise uh, in, in foreign policy. And let me ask it this way: um, uh, You you it's fascinating. You write about um, uh, uh, you know the United States rise to kind of preeminence in the in the world, and particularly after World War II. And, and the usual story is is one of you know rising economic power, uh, military power, uh, particularly after you know we were kind of the last nation standing after World War II, and um, and and to some extent around the power of the liberal ideas that we were. Um, but you argue that in you know I thought and it was super interesting in that particular moment when the U.S. really begins to it really takes a leadership role in the world. It was it was actually not those things so much as our very pragmatic problem solving orientation that in fact others in a sense ceded authority to us because we were helping solve a common problem of some kind or another which i i find fascinating you can comment on that but i i guess what where i'm going right now with this is uh you know in this moment it's a kind of a resurgence of realism right in the, you know in the discourse around American foreign policy, you know, the rise of China, the inevitable decline of the U.S., et cetera. But, it, it, you know, if you take that other view that it's about the form of our engagement, the form of our interactions in the world, what does that, you know, what, again, coming back to the original premise, if you were, you know, if you were to take that and kind of what is, and advise the Biden administration, what are the implications of that way of thinking as opposed to, let's call for the moment, let's say, you know, the realist paradigm? Yeah, so so that's a really good question. Um, and I um, have always thought about it a lot. Um, I mean, one of the things that's interesting is, is I do think the US has played a pragmatic role in the world many times. 
But I also feel like the US has not many times. And one of the things that I try to do um, in, in that article that you're talking about is kind of show that sometimes when the US is like pushing its ideas about sort of the global economy, for instance, it can really run into difficulties. Um, uh, the Bretton Woods Agreement was not actually created because the US was able to shove its ideas down mm. its throat. It was when the people that were trying to sort of lead in that way were sidelined and there were people who were willing to just engage on, okay, what can we do? What do we agree on? How can we begin to move forward? That the, the, the architecture around Bretton Woods um, was actually facilitated. And I think similarly, the, you know, the, the beginning of the end of the Cold War, many people tied to the Helsinki Agreement. Um, and the Helsinki Agreement did not come at a moment of incredible US strength. In fact, it came at a moment where the US was, you know, there was the OPEC crisis, um, the Soviet Union was looking like it was um, growing and becoming stronger in all of these different ways. Um, you know, the, the US was not in a position of great strength. Um, and interestingly, um, uh, President Nixon and, and Henry Kissinger did not take great um, ownership or even involvement in Helsinki. They kind of left it to the diplomats. Um, and the diplomats, um, alongside their European counterparts, mm. actually began to sort of think, what can we do? How can we engender connections um, that may you know, sort of ease, first of all, some of the hostility um, between the US and the Soviet Union, yeah. solve some problems. Um, you know, the Soviet Union was economically very um, uh, isolated. Um, and, you know, by offering certain kinds of economic aid, there, there was a feeling that you ought to be, you could get a little bit more openness. And then think about the people in the Soviet Union, you know, and um, uh, the, the whole kind of, human rights um, uh, portion of the Helsinki Agreement was initially thought of as almost kind of throwaway um, and turned out to be actually an incredible way of sort of connecting um, with, with people in the Soviet Union outside of the government. Um, and so I think that looking at that agreement, both how it was mm -hmm. made and how it kind of unfolded over time, we get, you know, kind of a sense of, you know, first of all, policies often kind of unintended, um, and there were a lot of That's unintended true, consequences, yeah. but there also was uh, attention to what was working and sort of building on that, which, you know, Jimmy Carter's um, push for human rights, kind of the, the way in which human rights became a central element of what the U.S. is, is really a product of responding to the ways in which um, the Helsinki Agreement um, uh, began to sort of gather force. So what does that mean for today? Um, first an of easy all, question. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, one of it is that, you know, there today there are so many different fora in which the U.S. can engage. And so I think that's one lesson is sort of looking at things sort of across the board. Uh -huh. The second is looking at problems, looking at things, you know, climate change, huge problem that you've written about many uh, at Corbell are, are working on, um, offers a lot of opportunity for engagement and not engagement that is just like, okay, we've solved it, um, but ways in which we can creatively pull people into the fold. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, um, there are a number of other issues. I mean, one of them that is, you know, we've talked a lot about in our great issues class and, you know, sort of as, as a country and as a world is global inequality. Um, and, you know, I've been really impressed at the degree to which the Biden administration is talking about this issue, not in terms of we must halt globalization, close the borders, you know, redistribute within the US, but that global inequality is global. And, um, you know, G20 just introduced who knows how long, how far it will go, but, you know, a uh, global minimum corporate tax, um, beginning yep. to sort of work yep. on, um, you know, global solution to these problems that are interdependent. Um, and I just, I want to say one footnote, because I'm not sure this, this matters as much to the Biden administration, but um, the global left generally, 
has really focused on government policy, which is incredibly mm. important. And I think they've, they've you know, there's, there's been a lot of really productive and important work in, in that area. They haven't focused as much on a global network around a project of sort of an inclusive way of managing global interdependencies. The global right has actually done that much more effectively. Mm -hmm. right. um, you know, just Very this week, there were headlines yeah. about, you know, various uh, Republican uh, spokespeople, you know, at a Hungarian conference talking, you know, and this, is, this has been something that's been in the news time and time again, um, you know, before, but certainly after the 2016 election. And I think the idea of building sort of a, a movement um, that is focused on listening at the grassroots, not just on affecting government policy and really generating sort of political um, force around a more sort of inclusive, open um, uh, approach to managing the world is, um, is a lesson that I would really like the left to take from pragmatism. Uh, very interesting. As you alluded to, I, you know, I, I think a little bit about uh, climate change. I suppose we all do these days. And, um, you know, it is a it is an enormous collective action problem. We can characterize it in many different ways, but it requires, uh, you know, individuals, governments, corporations, you know, all of us uh, to change behaviors in certain ways. Uh, in a dilemma, of course, that, uh, you know, uh, unless others do it, it really doesn't make much sense for us alone to do it. So it requires this coordination. Uh, I, uh, you know, you, you've, in one of your writings, you characterize this way of thinking, this, of this pragmatic approach as a useful way to generate collective action, which I was really struck by. Uh, so different from what we imagine as sort of high treaties, and you recognize the importance of those, obviously you referenced the Helsinki Accords, but this idea that um, there's this you know, kind of untidy, messy way in which if we name the problem and we convene and engage with each other, um, that we might actually model our way towards, if not a solution, improvements. Is that a useful paradigm for thinking, you know, for those of us who are thinking about collective action in the context of climate change. Is that a useful way of thinking about this? So I think it is. And in fact, I, I um, you know, um, Jessica Green, who's, who's written a tremendous amount on climate change um, in, in a book, um, we both have chapters in this book, and in her, in her chapter, she talks about the current um, state of the art on climate change is kind of all hands on deck. Um, but it actually was not that way in the 90s and the early 2000s. Um, and you know, one of the stories that um, I, I'm hoping to tell in the book I'm working on now is the way in which um, the US pullout of the Kyoto Agreement actually generated um, not simply a, oh my God, we're screwed um, <laughs> reaction, <laughs> although we certainly generated that, um, but also generated a, a a gazillion, not a gazillion, many, many mm -hmm. um, different yeah. governance experiments um, among cities, among industry groups, um, uh, you know, among regional governments. Um, uh, you know, someone who who I actually knew when he was a graduate student at GW, Matt Hoffman, has written about this. Um, uh, you know, actually charting all the governance experiments that grew um, after um, after that initial pullout. And so, you know, a big problem can also generate a different way of thinking. And many of these were really, really creative. Yeah. And, you know, I really credit Ban Ki-moon um, for sort of seeing this as an area in which the U.S. could work, not as a, you know, sort of leader of a parade, but really as an orchestrator around these different agreements, which came, there, there came to be sort of a, a second level um, in, yep. in the, um, the meetings uh, leading up to agreements where all of these different governance experiments were, um, were included. And I think the, the real interesting thing about the Paris Agreement is that not only does it offer avenues for countries at whatever level to participate, and I think that was a really important innovation as well, but it also allows these different initiatives to sign on 
you know, industry groups can sign on, civil society organizations can sign on, cities can sign on. And it has generated, I think, a lot of, you know, a shift in conversation from one just about emissions reduction, which was really what the Kyoto Accord was about, to one about decarbonization, mm-hmm. which I think we now know um, in the midst of, of the various crises we've seen in the last few years, that sort of getting to um, a management strategy for the climate change problem is not, it's not going to happen just because we do everything we do now on clean energy. We're going to have to change the way we live. Yeah. And I think that this, this conversation about decarbonization opens connections for thinking about work-life balance, for thinking about inequality, for thinking about how we do the economy um, in ways that really could generate creative new ways of thinking about how we move forward. Getting from here to there is very difficult yep. and I, I'm not, but but I, I am much more optimistic yes. about that possibility because of this all hands on deck and oh. and really prime, you know, um, appreciation of creativity that we see in the climate discourse right now. You know, I, 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 uh, I used the word optimistic earlier. I mean, it does feel to me a more optimistic take on the dynamics. Just to bring uh, up uh, uh, something close to home, the University of Denver just announced that it would be carbon neutral by 2030, which is fascinating, right? So this is a voluntary action of a university. It's part of a discourse, uh, uh, as you describe, uh, many universities or others are taking these stands. Uh, um, of course, governments are as well. Um, but you, you know, you, if you if classical theory of of, of uh, thinking about how we would solve the climate problem, you wouldn't expect this kind of proliferation of of you know. In this case, it's a very particular form of governance, right? In, at the at the very local level, so. It's, well, it's interesting because it also, it generates a certain amount of, of, it doesn't generate, it recognizes the agency that all of us have in a yes, way that I yes. think can be really productive as well. You know, the University of Denver is also a green campus. Um, and yet, you know, sometimes we go to these lunches and we have box lunches and there's these big piles of trash and, we're, you know, we're not always in the right place. Um, <laughs> And, but, you know, it's interesting because the staff um, at the C-Center and I were talking, you know, what can we do? Well, we can order compost bins. We can have our box lunches in compostable, um, 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 you know, uh, vehicles. Um, and um, they're, they're, it, it allows for people to sort of make changes at a micro level that sort of makes these big issue changes kind of make sense in daily life, which is really what it's going to take. If we're going to change the way we live, it's it's not going to come all by force. Um, it's not going to come, you know, simply by technological innovation. It'll become from both of those things for sure, but also people sort of recognizing we can change the way we live. We can feel good about it. We can feel like we have purpose. Um, and um, and and we can all begin to participate, which you know, going back to the beginning, yeah. is, is one of the sort of democratic features that that I really appreciate in pragmatism, both for its um, you know for you know because democracy is something that I value as a person, but also I think that that element is actually a really critical element in sort of generating the kind of collective action um, that is productive. Yeah, you know, I just, uh, I really uh, I really like that perspective. Um, I mean, before I carry on, let me just say to those in the audience, if, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box. Uh, we'll, we will, uh, I'll ask one more question or, or, or maybe two. Uh, but we'll save time for your questions as well. So um, uh, uh, put your questions in the Q&A uh, box and we'll try to get to as many of them uh, as we can. Um, I did, you mentioned among the many actors involved in this is uh, our, our businesses. And uh, I did want to turn to a, a, um, a, a line of work that you have, which really is of course an extension of this way of thinking, which is is the work that uh, that you've done on the role of, of corporate social responsibility. Um, some of it with our colleague Tricia Olson, um, um, in uh, and I think the focus is on the extractive industries. You have a project in Peru, 
And I found that fascinating because it, 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 it um, I think that if I understand the, the study, you really look at, um, uh, extra, you know, extractive, well, let me start with this, extractive industries are, you know, historically are often problematic um, uh, for places, mining, uh, oil, uh, et cetera. They generate a lot of wealth, but oddly, it doesn't and, and, uh, often help those nearby. In fact, often makes things worse through environmental side effects, of course, but also the, the, the distortions in the economy, et cetera, et cetera. And what what and there's a kind of a debate in there in the literature, which is, you know, how inevitable is the so-called research courage or not. And what I found fascinating is 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 a kind of it depends argument that you make, which is <laughs> which is, well, uh, let's look at a couple of places in Peru and look, one place is better than the other. And and, and it has to do with the way in which the 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 uh the business there engages with the community um, um is it uh, so say a bit more about that the way in which the you know this plays out and and why it is that it's not inevitable that extra you know in this case that the extractive industry be uh, uh, deleterious to the local community depending on what yeah yeah so depending on what um of course you asked me the hard question um, <laughs> So um, in the paper, we develop a, two different conceptualizations. Well, we don't really develop. We kind of use the literature that's out there to talk about um, CSR strategies in two ways. Um, one is um, we label transformational and the other is more transactional. And um, the, the transformational strategy really is um, kind of a pragmatic strategy. It's about sort of developing relationships um, in a community. And in, um, in the two minds we looked at, um, you know, there's a fascinating story about how we got here, which was we didn't actually find exactly what we expected. Um, I had been aware for a very long time about the voluntary principles in security and human rights and involved in mm -hmm. some of the conversations early on about that when I was researching um, the private security industry. And um, we kind of thought maybe we would find that companies that signed on to the voluntary principles or sort of active in these global initiatives would, um, would be more sort of productive in their relations with communities. We didn't actually find that. that right? um, but but we did find evidence of, um, of the logic behind that, um, which is the, the, um, the one company that we look at, which is uh, Freeport Macmoran and it's um, Cerro Verde Mine in Arequipa, Peru. Um, they, uh, they, we, we start in a period of great tumult um, where there had been a proposed expansion, protests, violence, um, and the company um, hired some consultants to kind of help them through the, the process. And the consultants, um, you know, suggested a relationship building exercise in the community mm. that connected um, first with, um, there were a group of um, kind of transitory population settlers on the outside side, outskirts of Arequipa that didn't have any access to water and um, were often working uh, in, in the mines. And um, the company ended up engaging mm. with um, a, a, a civil society group organized around, um, around these concerns and um, developed uh, you know, a set of conversations um, with these groups, also with the government, with other environmental groups. Um, and the the argument that they um, articulated is that we will have a social license to operate in this place um, to the extent that people feel like it will be better off even after the mine goes away. And um, they, they actually used indicators associated with the Human Development Index to measure how they were doing. Mm. And um, in doing that, they brought in all kinds of experts from the UN, from academia, from others to talk about human development, why it was important, how it, it worked. Um, and their engagement actually changed the way people in Arequipa, government officials, civil society leaders, people in the streets, um, as mm. well as people in the company, talked about what 
the mine was for, what the future of Artequipa was, and it, um, and it also generated a lot of important, what we call public goods. Um, they, they did um, uh, generate water um, for these settler communities. They uh, cleaned the river, they built sewage uh, treatment facilities, um, all of which allowed the mine mm. to operate, mm. but also greatly improved um, uh, the quality of life in that town. And we contrast it with um, the Yanacocha mine um, in um, uh, Cajamarca, Peru, um, which was all about, this is what we can do for you. Um, we'll give you jobs, um, you need water. Okay, we'll think about a loan for an individual community level, you know, kind of water thing, um, very much about, um, you know, we wanna ensure that we can continue to work here. So we make really good friends with the regional government. We kind of ignore or go around local government officials. Um, the, it was a very um, kind of clientelistic mm -hmm. approach, um, even though it's run by a company um, that is, is quite a good corporate global citizen. Um, and um, it, you know, what, what, what our argument is, is that these kinds of um, attention to relationships can actually kind of generate a shift in the way everyone talks about common um, concerns versus not in an area. Um, and there are downsides to it. Um, I mean, the, the company by developing these relationships has actually developed quite a lot of power in Atikipa that we can question. There certainly is no, it's very difficult to question development in Atikipa where it is easier in Cajamarca. But it has, you know, evaded um, some of the issues that the resource curse literature points to. Um, and I think is, is an important lesson to, um, to companies uh, um, around the world. So um, fascinating um, uh, that you're focused on the extractive you know, industries there because uh, mining there, uh, big issue, of course, big business in Colorado. And I'm just wondering whether there are lessons that you, you feel like you've learned uh, from that uh, examination of, of, of what happened in these two mines in, in uh, Peru to uh, things closer to home here in Colorado. Are these, uh, would you say, you know, at least some of the things that you find are really applicable here in the, in, in the US? Well, I think this, this idea of relationships being key to um, how minds operate is, and, and we, we actually have a follow-on project um, looking oh. at two mines, um, both run by uh, Freeport McMoran in Colorado, um, one um, which, which has a lot of community support, the Climax Mine, um, and another um, where the community kind of kicked the, the mine out, the Mount St. Emmons Mine in Crested Butte. Um, and so um, we, we actually have a project kind of looking at the dynamics of corporate community relationships in those two settings to better understand um, you know, why this company that was so successful in Peru had such mixed, mixed success um, in Colorado, because it's of course not just about the company, it's the relationship. Um, and so different community groups, um, uh, you know, the way the government is involved, et cetera, is, is also critically important. So we're really looking forward to doing more work. Well, that, that, um, that sounds fascinating. Well, I, I promised to uh, open to questions and uh, I've probably left uh, less time than I should have. So let me turn to some of the questions that people have, uh, have uh, written in the, in the Q and A. Um, um, Susan Abbott writes, she's very interested in the issue of how to better bridge the scholar to practitioner divide. Uh, she works on democ uh, democracy promotion and civil society strengthening. Um, uh, she does, um, uh, she, you know, she's agreeing. She's wondering who you're reading and which theorists and thinking thinkers you find inspirational these days. Oh my goodness, there's so many. I, I hesitate to say, um, any of them for, for fear of <laughs> leaving out others. Um, I will say um, I, I, uh, uh, there are a number of people, Henry Han, um, who is at Johns Hopkins University, um, has, has written some amazing things. Um, and I think, um, you know, my good friend, former colleague, former C Center uh, faculty member, Erica Chenoweth, um, is doing sort of uh, interesting work in this area. 
um, there's a lot of sociologists. Um, there's a huge um, literature in sociology um, that is increasingly kind of merging, I think, with um, uh, the literature in um, political science, uh, looking at the way in which um, civil action, civil society, um, uh, different groups are sort of articulated. Um, and, um, and so I would look in that direction. And then finally, there, there is a sort of growing literature on pragmatism. Um, the, the forum that you mentioned earlier fits mm -hmm. where my, um, my girly paper is. Um, I didn't is, call it that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love to call it that. Um, but uh, anyway, that, that forum is um, really what the inspiration for it was that pragmatism has had such growth in IR theory but it, it, it has had less empirical application and, and partly the forum is sort of wondering why that is the case. Um, but we're, we're hoping that in, in that kind of intervention that you'll sort of generate more um, uh, attention to the way that um, the, this kind of thinking about politics can be, can be useful. And, you know, Sebastian Schmidt, Simon Pratt, um, there's a number of um, uh, other people, uh, Molly Cochran, um, who have who done really interesting work in this area. Uh, it's great. It's a, it's a rich conversation um, for sure. Um, let me turn to another question. Our, our colleague, new colleague, Ajene Clements, uh, is asking, um, uh, could you offer insights about how to gauge what's possible so that we're not shortchanging ourselves when negotiating change? Often we think about refraining from pushing too far, but there are times when we might not push enough, stopping short of what's possible out of fear. Yeah, also, that's, a, that's a great question. And I do think um, this is an area where I think pragmatism actually can help a lot because it doesn't make a judgment ahead of time about what's possible. It encourages us to experiment, to see what actually works. And, and I, think, um, I think a lot um, or have thought a lot in the last couple of years um, around you just sort of we've had a number of events and occurrences that we never thought were possible um, but and some of them haven't been great um, but they have led us to to question things more deeply than we used to um, and um, I've seen that in my field um, you know the field of security studies is often articulated around a very exclusionary set of ideas mm. um, it's rooted historically in um, quite a lot of racism and exclusion and exploitation. And um, there, the, the tendency really has been to, to simply use those concepts and not really grapple with their history. And um, I think in the wake of the January 6th insurrection, um, the protests around police violence, there's been much more reflection in the security studies community about the ways in which these conceptions that we're using might be bringing with them limits to what we're thinking about when we're thinking about the possibilities for a more sort of inclusive approach to security and the way in which, you know, maybe attention to, you know, issues of racism leads to like better civil military relations. Maybe that leads to better participation um, in conflict situations where Maybe it's not about using the maximum amount of force, but using force that is more useful for coming to terms um, that, that essentially end the conflict. And so I, I think that there's more possibility now than there has been in the past because people have been willing to sort of grapple with those issues. And I do think I, you know, my feeling is, you know, spit out ideas, see if they work. Um, and, um, and I think that thinking about what's doable in advance as opposed to experimenting um, is often a way that we sort of close off pathways instead of opening them. So uh, you bring in, um, uh, brought up uh, January 6th, US domestic politics. So we have a question about US uh, politics. I think it, it uh, um, which is uh, Herb Josepher, asks, how do we develop relationships and pragmatic solutions when the other side here, I'm not sure which side he's on, but the other side here in the US is not interested in truth. 
So you're, you know, there's a, there's a kind of assumption that everybody's in the same problem solving orientation in pragmatism, or maybe that's unfair. But anyway, how do how would you respond to Herb's question? So, um, you know, there are a lot of places in the United States um, that voted for Obama in 2012 and voted for Trump in 2016. Um, I think that, you know, sort of a pragmatic orientation would really have us think about those issues and think about the way in which, how is it, you know, not everybody, you know, switched, but some people did. Um, and what about that, the, the sort of framing led them to sort of think in those different ways. Um, and I really, you know, this is one thing that um, I talk about in my classes, it's complicated, it's hard to talk about in sort of public fora, but pragmatism doesn't assume that people are like set in a certain way. It, it assumes that people play a lot of different roles. The way I interact as a mom is different from how I interact as a professor, as a policy advisor, as a you know um, a human rights advocate. And getting people to think about themselves in different roles, you can also generate sort of attention to different mm -hmm. sorts of things. And um, my, my best example is not a good example from American politics, but actually an example from the US government. Um, when I was um, working on private security governance, um, you know, in the wake of just disasters in Iraq and Afghanistan um, associated with these companies, mm. that, you know, I, I'm on record telling the ICRC and the Swiss government you know, governance is just like, it's not gonna happen. And it's not gonna happen because US government is adamantly opposed to any idea about transnational regulation. Yeah. And it was, State Department, Defense Department, everybody I talked to, it's like private security was all about flexibility. They didn't want any muddling at the transnational level in their sort of flexible use of these tools. Well, in the process of sort of a set of meetings and literally it was only a set of meetings and it was a set of meetings that even had a really lukewarm agenda because the only way to get the US to attend was to say we're not going to talk about anything new all we're going to talk about is what established international agreements say potentially about private security companies in the course of those conversations the people who were involved from the US government from the state department and the department of defense completely changed the way they thought about transnational regulation. Instead of being about something that might impede the flexibility of the US, it became something that might enhance their capacity to get these problems under control. And so if you could get, you know, really brilliant, amazing people in both of these mm. um, uh, places, very well educated, you know, but had a really particular perspective to in engaging around sort of different ideas. And it's not like facts necessarily, but, no, you know, no. think about this situation, think about this situation, use this narrative, this scenario. You, they actually came to sort of think about things really, really differently. And I think if that can happen there, it can happen anywhere. Um, and so I do think that this idea of engagement not assuming that people are one way or another because of the way they voted um, can also be a very productive way for us to think about sort of moving beyond the current divide. Yeah, it's a, uh, again, it's wonderfully, and I uh, use the word optimistic in, in some ways, and we are often kind of uh, at this moment feeling like this is hopeless, uh, polarization is, is intractable. Um, and, and yet, if uh, I mean, what I hear you saying, which I've, I've seen in myself in, in, in situations I've been is if you can get people to focus on the problem and park for a moment, their sort of, you know, knee jerk ideological stances of one some kind or another, then people really uh, can evolve. And anyway, that's a wonderfully um, positive, perhaps note to to um, end on we are, we are just at time. There's one last question, though, I wanted to frame it that you referenced earlier, Sheila Vandegraaff says, just by the way, what is feminist ghetto? <laughs> well, I think the, the argument is that, you know, in, in saying that you, you know, you're a feminist scholar, 
then you are essentially restricting yourself yeah. to one week of the syllabus. Um, and um, that's that's actually, um, if, if I do anything in, in my last, um, you know, 10 years or whatever in this field, um, it's to try to um, break that down. Um, I, I, I integrate um, issues of gender and race in um, every part of my syllabus, um, partly um, just to get people to sort of think in different ways. Um, but um, I think um, there's been such incredible, rich research um, in, um, uh, in feminist uh, theorizing that could inform social policy at so many different levels. And, um, and yet it's been isolated from the mainstream. And I think um, we need to change that. Um, so uh, so I'm, I'm jumping into the ghetto <laughs> in the hopes that we can sort of break down um, those walls um, and and sort of bring its insights back to mainstream theorizing. Well, um, it's a wonderful place to end, I think. Um, what a pleasure it's been to talk with you and to explore these ideas and to see that these theoretical ideas actually have real purchase in the real world, which is what so much of your work is about. Thanks so much for being with us and thanks to all of you in the audience for joining us today. Thanks, Fritz, and thanks everyone. It was a delight. Bye.